He arrived at Tan San Nut in a drizzling rain two nights after the raids on the pagodas. He looked a bit old-fashioned when the door of the plane opened and he emerged into the glare of the television spotlights with a straw hat in his hand. As he walked down the steps of the gangway, one saw that he was too long of limb at nearly six feet three inches to be called lanky. He was, rather, the lean and angular man that popular legend said New England Yankees were supposed to be. His profile was cut precisely, the jaw pronounced, the nose large and slightly hooked. Sixty-one years had rounded his shoulders, brought his neck and head forward, and grayed his hair. Otherwise, one could still recognize the man in the photographs of his prime. The freshman senator from Massachusetts in 1936, the one Republican star in Franklin Roosevelt's landslide against Alfred Landon, the Army Lieutenant Colonel on the Western Front in World War II, a leading Republican senator of the post-war era, the national political strategist who had persuaded Eisenhower to run for president and had been Ike's campaign manager in 1952, Eisenhower's ambassador to the United Nations when the post had truly been second in rank and prestige, to that of the Secretary of State, the man Eisenhower had trusted to escort Nikita Khrushchev on his historic tour of the United States in 1959, and then what had seemed an unsatisfactory end to his public life, Nixon's running mate in the election against Kennedy. The straw hat was a clue to the man, Henry Cabot Lodge, Jr., was an anachronism in American public life by the 1960s, a man of character and lineage with independent political stature. He had modeled himself on the grandfather after whom he had been named Senator Henry Cabot Lodge, Republican senator from Massachusetts for 31 years, closest friend and collaborator of Theodore Roosevelt and one of the founders of the American empire. If any two men could claim principal responsibility for the seizure of the Philippines and the transformation of the United States into a power abroad, the Elder Lodge and Theodore Roosevelt would be those two men. Lodge's grandfather had been at his most brilliant as an orator when he had been calling the country to its new destiny on the eve of the war with Spain that had started the imperial venture. The Senate galleries would fill to hear him speak. He had been the author of the famous description of the commencement, It has been a splendid little war. It was yet another irony of this war in Vietnam that 65 years after that beginning, the grandson of one of the founders should be sent to Saigon to resolve a major crisis of the overseas order, a crisis that was eventually to challenge the American role in the world that the grandfather had initiated and the grandson had helped bring to maturity. Halberstam and I and the other correspondents would have felt less beleaguered had we been privy to the secret debate in Washington. We did not realize that our dispatches had been arming Averill Harriman, who had moved up to become Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs, and Roger Hillsman, who had replaced Harriman in the Far Eastern Affairs Post at State, in their attempt to persuade Kennedy to authorize the overthrow of Diem and his family. We would have been still more encouraged had we known how much our reporting, and Van's view of the war as it was reflected in that reporting, had contributed to shaping the judgment of this man, who was to take the power of the United States into his hands in Vietnam in the late summer and fall of 1963, and wield it as he saw fit. Shortly after his arrival, Halberstam, Brown, and I were invited to have lunch, individually, with the new ambassador and his wife, Emily, a lady from the Boston merchant family of Sears, whose sprightliness and wit leavened the marriage. We were told that the lunches were to be private, that Mr. Lodge wanted our advice. When my turn came, he questioned me about the regime, the Buddhist crisis, and the war for about an hour at the table and over coffee afterward in the drawing room of the embassy residence. He put the questions matter-of-factly. I watched his face to see what he thought of the answers, but his expression stayed blandly uncommunicative. I told him in sum that the No-Dins were so mad and hated that they were incapable of governing, that the Viet Cong were gaining rapidly in the countryside, and that if Diem and his family stayed in power, the war was certain to be lost. If they were replaced by a military regime, there was no guarantee that a junta of generals would do better, but there was hope that they might. With the Nengo Dins, one could look forward only to defeat. We had been warned that Lodge was to do the questioning, that we were not to attempt to pry anything out of him. I did not want to leave, however, without obtaining something. And what's your impression, Mr. Ambassador? I asked as it was time to go. He was sitting on the couch beside his wife, his legs crossed lazily, and his arm extended behind her. He smiled. 
About the same as yours, he said. I was skeptical of his proffered frankness. I wondered if this was more flattery, as inviting reporters in their twenties to give advice to Henry Cabot Lodge had been, regardless of how sincerely he might be seeking information. In retrospect, I was wrong to be skeptical, and the other reporters and I soon ceased to be. Lodge's public behavior and the secret cables in the Pentagon Papers disclosed that he had virtually made up his mind before he arrived. We are launched on a course from which there is no respectable turning back. The overthrow of the Diem government, he told Kennedy in a top-secret cable just a week after he landed in the rain at Tan Sun Nut and prior to any luncheon interrogations. He gave the president the fundamental reason that the United States could not shrink from this intimidating business. There is no possibility, in my view, that the war can be won under a Diem administration. Our reporting and Van's investment in it might have been wasted on most of the other important figures in the U.S. government. The effort had not been wasted on Lodge. The explanation was not that he had spent most of his twenties as a reporter and editorial writer, first for the Boston Transcript and then for the New York Herald Tribune. The explanation was in the peculiar mix of the man, the self-containment of the aristocrat, the sensitivity of the politician to human factors, and a perspective on the military leaders of the 1960s that reached back into the pre-World War II era. Unlike Kennedy, McNamara, and Rusk, he did not think that these generals were necessarily more competent to judge wars than he was. Taylor and Harkins, an old military acquaintance of Lodge's as another Bostonian, had been his contemporaries in the Army. He had followed the martial tradition of his family by joining the Cavalry Reserve in Boston in 1923, had gone on maneuvers every summer, and had progressed with the Army of the Twenties and Thirties from horses to the tanks of Patton's new 2nd Armored Division in the maneuvers of 1941. He had been in the first tank fighting of the war to involve Americans in mid-1942, when Marshall and Eisenhower had arranged for him to lead an exploratory mission to the British Eighth Army in Libya, and Rommel had unexpectedly attacked. Henry Stimson, the Secretary of War, had managed to keep Lodge in the Senate as the Army's unofficial representative there, until the beginning of 1944. With the battle for Europe coming, Lodge had been unable to resist any longer. He had resigned his seat to serve as a lieutenant colonel, the first senator to do so since the Civil War. After World War II, he had maintained his interest in military affairs and in 1963 was a major general in the active reserve. Lodge had been assured in briefings at the Pentagon and at Admiral Felt's headquarters in Honolulu that the reporters were contriving stories about flaws in the Saigon forces and Viet Cong gains. He had thought it unlikely that reporters as a group would consistently invent such information. He had also decided that a regime as grotesque as Diem's in its political behavior could not be expected to win a war. He had known that his invitations to lunch would flatter. He went out of his way in his dealings with all of the reporters to gain as good a press as possible for himself, he had also been interrogating us to take our measure and to see if we had anything of further use to him in the enterprise he had begun. He was two months bringing his task to fruition. Publicly, he isolated Diem and his family and made them vulnerable to a coup by implying repeatedly in word and gesture that the United States, in the person of Henry Cabot Lodge, would like nothing better than to see them overthrown. On his first morning in Saigon, he insulted the Ngo Dins by ostentatiously driving to the AID headquarters next to the Sha Loi Pagoda, where the two monks were sheltering, telling them they were welcome, and ordering fresh vegetables bought daily for the vegetarian diet to which Buddhist monks adhere. When the chief Buddhist leader, Tri Quang, and the two other monks who had slipped out of Sha Loi and into hiding with him ahead of the raids, ran into the embassy lobby a couple of days later and asked for asylum. Lodge granted it to them and gave them a new conference room as temporary living quarters. Secretly, Lodge put Lou Conan to work as his liaison to three dissident ARVN generals. To remove the Ngo Dins, Lodge utilized some of the same senior ARVN officers whom Conan had worked with at Lansdale's direction in 1955 to install Diem as America's man in Saigon. They had been colonels then, and Diem had made them generals for coming over to his side. He and his family had later alienated them. They were all members of the small Franco-Vietnamese elite the colonial system had created and had been French citizens until. They would have left with the French Expeditionary Corps had they not been encouraged by American power and money 
and its representatives like Lansdale and Conine to stay and attempt to preserve in the South the colonial society in which they had been reared. The leader of the plot was the second-ranking general in the ARVN, Major General Duong Von Min, 47, Big Min, as he was called for his six-foot build. He was from a well-to-do Southern family, born at Mai Tho, and had attended the best French lycée in Saigon as a youth, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, the same school where Prince Sihanouk of Cambodia had been educated. Prior to 1945, he had belonged to the exclusive group of 50 Vietnamese who held a commission in the French army. Min's height and broad shoulders were not the only reason for his unusual appearance. His two upper front teeth had been broken by the interrogators of the Kempe Thai, the dreaded Japanese military police when the Imperial Army suddenly disarmed the Vichy French forces in Indochina in 1945. He refused to have the teeth replaced. In early 1955, during the street fighting with the Bin Suyen and the maneuvering of the pro Bao Dai officers to oust Lansdale's man, Min had been able to help Diem as commanding officer of the Saigon garrison. Later, he had been put in charge of destroying the army of the Hoa Hau sect in the Delta. By 1963, Diem had sidetracked him into the fictitious post of military advisor to the president. Since Diem accepts no advice, Min has lots of time to scheme. Colonel Dong remarked. Min's most important associate in the plot was another officer who had rallied to Deem's support at Lansdale's and Conan's behest in the spring of 1955, and who had been more adept at holding some of Diem's trust in the intervening years, Major General Tran Van Don, 46th Chief of Staff of the ARVN in 1963. Don was the unusually handsome son of an aristocratic family. He had been born in France, near Bordeaux, and had attended the Haute Études Commerciales in Paris before World War II in the French Army. Don's brother-in-law Brig, General Levan Kim, 45, was the third plotter. Kim had been a general without an assignment for nearly three years by 1963, having been fired as head of the military academy by Diem on suspicion of complicity in the abortive 1960 paratrooper coup. He had studied mathematics and philosophy in Marseille, joined as the intellectual of the ARVN. Harkins was opposed to a coup. He did not want to disrupt the war he thought he was winning. He regarded Diem as a satisfactory local ruler and viewed the Buddhist crisis as a passing intrigue. The raids on the pagodas were an unfortunate loss of temper. The noose were to blame for the raids, and Diem might be coaxed into parting with them in time. Harkins had other allies in Washington besides Taylor. McNamara and Rusk also saw the situation essentially as he did. Lodge knew that he would lose if he confronted Harkins and the system, despite the additional weight with Kennedy that his independent political stature gave him. He therefore handled Harkins by indirection, and Harkins, who thought himself a master bureaucrat, was outwitted at his game. Lodge was always polite in his personal dealings with Harkins, and when he had to refer to him in a cable, he called him a splendid general and an old friend of mine. He then hid from Harkins his cables to Washington about Conan's meetings with the generals, sent for greater security through the CIA's separate communications system, until it was too late for Harkins to interfere effectively. Min and Don helped Lodge by confusing Harkins even then as to whether there was a plot. Because they were afraid that he would betray them to Deem, they lied and told the general they were not planning a coup. Lodge also undercut Harkins's judgment on the war. He sent Kennedy independent assessments again without copies to the general, that contradicted Harkins's optimism. Once more, Lodge was careful not to confront. He did not assert baldly that the war was being lost. He said this by filling his reports with the bad news that Harkins was suppressing, and by letting others say it for him. The plotters were of help here, too. These Saigon generals knew they were losing the war, which was another reason they were so eager to overthrow the No Dins. On September, Lodge sent a top-secret cable marked for president only, giving Min's view that the Viet Cong are steadily gaining in strength, have more of the population on their side than has the GVN, government of Vietnam, the Saigon regime, that arrests are continuing and that the prisons are full, that more and more students are going over to the Viet Cong, that there is great graft and corruption in the Vietnamese administration of our aid, and that the heart of the army is not in the war. This assessment by Vietnamese No. 1 General, Min was considered by Americans, including Harkins, to be the most professional of the Saigon generals, 
was being echoed by DM's faithful acting minister of defense, Nguyen Dinh Thuan, who wants to leave the country, Lodge went on to tell Kennedy. He also warned in other cables against Harkins's claim that DM was a good man who was being victimized by the noose and might eventually be persuaded to rid the regime of them. He pointed out that the brothers did not see the world differently, and that DM was convinced he needed new skill at manipulating the police and intelligence services in order to keep the army in check. DM wishes he had more noose, not less, Lodge said. Kennedy was uncertain and wavered. He had virtually no understanding of political and social revolution in modern Asia, and little feeling for the realities of counter-guerrilla warfare. He feared a wave of communist-inspired guerrilla wars in the underdeveloped countries and was determined to build a capability to crush them. But he lacked knowledge of what he feared. Had he possessed sensitivity on the subject, he would have stopped Harkins and Anthus from bombing and shelling the Vietnamese peasantry. He was constantly issuing instructions and suggestions for counter-guerrilla warfare to the Army through his military aide, Major General Chester Clifton, Jr. His ideas never went much beyond employing Special Forces men, popularly known as Green Berets because of their headgear, in Terry and the Pirates' ventures, and the sort of technological gimmickry and super-spy intrigues that filled the James Bond novels he liked to read. It was Kennedy who had given the Special Forces their romantic headgear to mark them as the shock troops of his wars in the shadows. At a National Security Council meeting at the White House on Friday on September 6, 1963, he accepted a suggestion from McNamara to fly Krulak out in a jet to get the facts and report back to the NSC by Tuesday. Hillsman interjected that a State Department representative should also go along for an independent viewpoint. Kennedy agreed. McNamara tried to outsmart Hillsman by putting Krulak in the air to Vietnam within minutes of the end of the meeting. Hillsman telephoned and made him hold the plane until he could get his man, Joseph Mendenhall, the former political counselor of the embassy, out to Andrews Air Force Base near Washington. The plane was a windowless Boeing 707, an Air Force tanker version of the four-engine passenger jet, coverted for the ferrying of important men by the installation of desks and bunks. The type had been nicknamed the McNamara Special because of the secretary's fondness for fly and sprint trips. 20,000 miles and four days later, Krulak and Mendenhall read diametrically opposed reports to another NSC meeting at the White House on Tuesday, September 10th. You two did visit the same country, didn't you? Kennedy asked. I can explain it, Mr. President, Krulak said. Mr. Mendenhall visited the cities and I visited the countryside, and the war is in the countryside. I want to see you after this in my office, Kennedy said to Krulak. McNamara accompanied Krulak into the Oval Office when the meeting had ended. The President looked up from something he was reading. I just wanted you to know that I understand, he said to Krulak, indicating by his manner that he was preoccupied and did not wish to talk. Krulak and McNamara left. In the limousine on the way back to the Pentagon, McNamara and Taylor were pleased. They interpreted Kennedy's remark in the Oval Office as meaning, I understand what happened and I agree with you. Krulak was also happy. He interpreted the President's remark similarly and was convinced that he had put down Mendenhall. Kennedy may have agreed with Krulak, but he sent McNamara and Taylor to Vietnam two weeks later for more facts. One of Lodge's independent assessments may have prompted him, perhaps the cable relaying Min's frightening views. By the end of September, when the jet carrying McNamara and Taylor lifted off from Tan Son Nut with another report for Kennedy, one could drive down to Mai Tho and see the ghosts of the strategic hamlets along the road. The lines of steel fence posts with shreds of chopped off barbed wire hanging from the notches announced who owned most of this main route into the Delta. From a helicopter, the sense of the guerrilla's power was greater, and the sight of these ghost hamlets stranger. The rows of roofless houses looked like villages of play huts that children had erected and then whimsically abandoned. McNamara and Taylor assured Kennedy that the military campaign has made great progress and continues to progress, despite serious political tensions in Saigon, and that the war would still be won by the end of 1965. Harkins should win it sooner in the rubber plantation country and in the highlands and the central coast provinces north of Saigon, they said in their top-secret memorandum of October 2nd. He should crush the Viet Cong there by the end of 1964.
The slower progress in the Delta would delay the defeat of the guerrillas south of the capital until the end of 1965, and it should be possible to withdraw the bulk of U.S. personnel by that time. They recommended pulling out 1,000 Americans by the end of 1963 in order to demonstrate how well the plans for victory were being implemented. The White House announced a forthcoming withdrawal of this first 1,000 men. The president gained no peace of mind. The analysts at the CIA told him that Saigon's military position was deteriorating, and the State Department's Bureau of Intelligence and Research said that there had been an unfavorable shift in the military balance since July and that the regime would have been in trouble in the countryside even without the Buddhist crisis. Kennedy showed how confused he was and how angry he had become at the messenger who most annoyed him when Arthur Oakes Sulzberger, who had recently become publisher of The Times, paid a courtesy call at the White House on October 22nd. As soon as the pleasantries were over, Kennedy asked, What do you think of your young man in Saigon? Sulzberger said that he thought Halberstam was holding up well. Don't you think he's too close to Jestery? Kennedy asked. No, Sulzberger said he did not. Kennedy pushed harder. Had Sulzberger thought about transferring Halberstam? He asked. Sulzberger said that he had no plans to do so. If Kennedy had not been so upset, he probably would not have taken such a crude approach. Sulzberger was reacting defensively, as publishers almost always do when their reporters are attacked. Catledge? The managing editor in New York, who had been so upset by Halberstam, was with Sulzberger on the White House visit. He would have been happy to transfer Halberstam out of Saigon, but he could not do so while the paper might lose face. Halberstam, without knowing that the president had personally requested his transfer, thought that the no-dins were going to grant Kennedy's wish. He told Van in a letter on October 29th that he suspected they would throw him out of Vietnam in a couple giraffe weeks. His visa expired in mid-November. He was writing to thank Van for having defended our reporting and letters to the editors of Newsweek and Time. Newsweek published Van's letter in its October 21, 1963 issue. Time declined to print it. We all still miss you and refer to you as the Bible, Halberstam wrote. There's damn little joy in covering something which has such a sour meaning for your country, he said. The brightest spot is Lodge, whose performance for my money has been near perfect. He's tough and intelligent, and he has few illusions about this situation. He doesn't intend to see the U.S. kicked around, and he doesn't think this N'Go outfit is worth a tinker's dam. The weaponry and firepower of the Viet Cong battalions in the Delta was getting better and better. Very ominous, Halberstam told Van. And watching a police state in action, particularly an odd American financed one, is a sad experience. But we still have a chance, I guess. And I like the way Lodge handles himself. Kennedy ended by deferring to Lodge's judgment. Lodge had exacted what he needed from McNamara and Taylor during their late September visit. In response to his arguments, they had conceded in their memorandum to Kennedy that further repressive actions by Diem and New could change the present favorable military trends, and had recommended the suspension of economic aid and the cutting off of military and CIA support for Tung's special forces as a way of exerting pressure for conciliation and reform. Lodge had wanted both measures in order to hold up the largest possible go sign to the dissident generals. Kennedy decided on October 5th to let Lodge have his way. The plotting, which had been in hiatus, resumed in earnest. Kennedy asked only Jay that Lodge guarantee him a successful coup that he not be forced to endure the disgrace of another Bay of Pigs. Lodge would not mislead the president. He said that he thought the plot would succeed, but he could give no guarantee. Should the coup fail, he cabled, we will have to pick up the pieces as best we can at that time. Diem and New erected their own scaffold. Toward the end of October, they discovered the plot that Lodge had been fomenting and decided to take advantage of it to spring a scheme they had conceived. They summoned General Din to the palace. He had continued to rule Saigon for them as its military governor since the sacking of the pagodas. The brothers instructed Din to draw up troop movement plans for a false coup. The phony coup had two purposes. The long-range purpose was to scare the Americans out of ever again attempting to interfere with their rule. This objective was to be achieved by making the false coup appear to be a neutralist J. coup. Since the surprise coup d'etat in Laos in I-960 by Kong Le, the neutralist paratroop commander, 
Washington had feared the possibility of a similar occurrence in Saigon by some hostile or opportunistic group who would demand a U.S. withdrawal. The demand would make a mockery of the American claim that the United States was in Vietnam at the invitation of a Vietnamese government to defend the South against outside aggression. The National Liberation Front was calling for the replacement of the No Dins by a neutralist coalition. Charles de Gaulle, then President of France, was also promoting the idea as a solution to the war. The Kennedy administration regarded it accurately as a face-saving arrangement for a takeover by Ho Chi Minh. Nu had been playing on the fear by feigning negotiations with Hanoi through Manelli, the senior Polish delegate to the ICSC and the French ambassador. He had also been Jay talking about the possibility of asking the Americans to withdraw and of turning South Vietnam into a country like Yugoslavia, which would accept aid from both communist and non-communist nations. Nu had been mistaking for independence the slack in the string to which he and Diem were tied. He had not realized that his blackmail had played into Lodge's hands further alarming Kennedy. When the brothers had sacked the pagodas, they had put out a cover story to try to shift the blame from themselves by having Radio Saigon and the government press agency announce that the raids had been carried out by the army and that the generals had requested Diem to declare martial law. Under their false coup scheme, they were going to have the radio and their press agency announce the formation of a neutralist coalition and broadcast a demand that the United States pull out of the country. They would have Din occupy the streets and main public buildings with troops and armor and emerge and announce that they had saved South Vietnam by crushing a neutralist plot. During the confusion, they planned to carry out the second and immediate purpose of their false coup, a small bloodbath. They were going to have Tung's special forces and news hired gangsters, murder Min, Don, Kim, and a number of other generals and senior ARVN officers they suspected of involvement in the plot. Civilian accomplices of the generals like Diem's titular vice president, Nguyen Ngoc Tho, and some Americans. They would later blame the killings on neutralist and pro-communist elements. How many and precisely which Americans were to be killed has never been ascertained. Lodge was supposed to have been marked, but there will never be any way of knowing. Konayan was an obvious target, as Diem and Nu had by now learned of his role in the plot. Ihu codenamed the scheme Operation Bravo-1. What Diem and Nu did not realize was that in drawing up the movement order for Bravo-1, Din was actually bringing into Saigon the troops and tanks and armored personnel carriers to conduct a second scheme codenamed Operation Bravo-2. Except for Chow, who sat in Cantho in ignorance of the plot, Diem and Nu had run out of generals. Their faithful Din, the same Din who had boasted two months earlier to his old CIA friend Konin that he had made himself a great national hero, by foiling the American Cabot Lodge, had turned traitor. Min and Don had tricked Diem into offending him. They had told Dien that he was a great national hero, and that he should ask Diem to reward him by appointing him Minister of the Interior. When Dien had tried to claim his reward, Diem had refused. He and Nu had already paid Din a large cash reward. Din had gone off in a sulk, and the plotters had then recruited him, promising him the ministry and their government. As insurance, they also recruited the officers under him, so that they could shoot him and seize command of the troops and armor if he changed his mind at the last moment and tried to turn traitor on them. Bravo 2 began at 11.30 p.m. on November 1, 1963, with the storming of the National Police Headquarters by a battalion of Saigon Marines. Three hours later, Diem telephoned Lodge from the palace. By the time of the call, which was tape-recorded, Diem knew enough to realize that his position was hopeless. Tan Son Nut and all of the city other than the palace and the nearby Presidential Guards barracks were in the hands of the coup forces. Diem had learned that Din was a traitor, that his other pillar, Tung, had been tricked into a meeting with the generals at JGS headquarters in Sho Ti, and that Chow was blocked from coming to the rescue with troops from Cantho. Min and Don had told Diem over the phone from JGS that they would give him a new safe conduct out of the country if he surrendered and resigned the presidency. They had then put all of the other generals who had joined them on the line one by one, so that he would understand the futility of resistance. They had also broadcast the offer over Radio Saigon. The offer might be a trick. If Diem surrendered, he and Nu might be murdered. He would, however, save the lives of the soldiers holding out at the palace and the presidential guards' barracks. Some units have made a rebellion, and I want to know what is the attitude of the U.S.? Diem asked Lodge. 
The ambassador evaded the question. He told Diem, I am worried about your physical safety, and asked a question himself. I have a report that those in charge of the current activity offer you and your brother safe conduct out of the country if you resign. Had you heard this? Lodge had wanted the generals to make the safe conduct offer in order to avoid the bad publicity of an assassination. His question carried a question within it that Diem could not have failed to hear after nine years of dealing with American and other foreign statesmen. By raising the safe conduct offer in these circumstances, Lodge was extending the offer himself and saying that it was not a trick. The American ambassador was telling Diem that the U.S. government would fly him and his brother to safety if Diem would formally relinquish authority. Diem gave Lodge an answer in the language of implication that statesmen use when they wish to say clearly what they do not want to say, literally. No, Diem replied. He had not heard of the safe conduct offer. Lodge carefully left the offer open should Diem later change his mind. If I can do anything for your physical safety, please call me, Lodge said. I am trying to reestablish order, Diem answered. He did not call back. He was at the end what he had been at the beginning, a self-willed anachronism, an obstinate pseudo-Mandarin lost in his reverie of an imaginary past. While there was life in his body, he would never resign and abdicate the role of emperor, had Lonsdale had made it possible for him to assume. After all, I am a chief of state, he said Joe Lodge earlier in their phone conversation. I have tried to do my duty. I believe in duty above all. The presidential guard's barracks was overrun before midnight in an assault by a paratroop battalion. The palace fell at dawn. Diem and Nu had secretly fled from it during the night to hide in the house of a Chinese businessman in Cholon who had grown wealthy on their favors. The brothers apparently deluded themselves into thinking that Chao might still come to their rescue from the Delta. Cholon is on the south side of Saigon. The loyal presidential guards holding the palace had not realized until they discovered Diem's absence at dawn that they were dying for a shell. With the fall of the palace, the symbol of Diem's authority was also gone, and the value of his resignation fell accordingly. He also angered Min by telephoning early on the morning of November 2nd to say that he would meet Min at the palace to surrender and resign. The preparations for the abdication ceremony had been ready since the previous afternoon. The generals had a table set up and covered with a green baize cloth in a conference room in the main headquarters of the JGS compound. There was a chair waiting in front of it for Diem to sit in when he signed the document of resignation. Min went to the palace. Diem failed to appear. Later in the morning, the brothers were traced to a church in Cholon, where they had gone to hear mass and were seized. Min had had enough of Diem's trickery and he feared the fox alive. He decided that safe conduct for him was to murder both brothers. He sent his aide, Ajna Jor, to be the executioner. The major shot them with his pistol while they were being brought to JGS inside an armored personnel carrier, with their hands bound behind them. The soldiers mutilated New's corpse by stabbing it repeatedly with bayonets. For the first time in the history of the war, crowds in Saigon spontaneously cheered ARVN soldiers. Girls gave them bouquets of flowers. Men bought them beer and soda. Women carried pots of tea and food to the parks and schools where they were bivouacked. Madame Nu escaped because she was in the United States on a publicity tour to try to drum up support for the regime. She had been notably unsuccessful. Public opinion polls showed disapproval of her statements by 13 to 1. Lodge saw that her children, who were at the family's villa at the mountain resort of Dalat when the coup occurred, were protected and flown to her in Rome. Diem's older brother, Archbishop Thuc, also escaped. The Vatican had called him to Rome in an effort to disassociate the Church from the regime's behavior toward the Buddhists. Ken, the younger brother and overlord of central Vietnam, the one member of the family who had vainly urged consolating the monks was not as fortunate. He took refuge in the U.S. consulate in Hue with an airline's bag full of gold leaf and greenbacks. Lodge had him tricked out of the consulate and onto an American plane on the assumption that he would be flown to asylum in the Philippines. The plane stopped at Tan Sun Nut. Can was handed over to the generals. He was later shot by a firing squad. Chow thought that he was going to be shot too, but he was merely fired. Lodge was not unhappy that Diem and Nu had declined the offer of safe conduct out of the country. What would we have done with them if they had lived, he said to Halberstam. Every Colonel Blimp in the world would have made use of them. 
The hope that Halberstam had expressed in his letter to Van three days before the coup was misplaced. The overthrow of the Ungo Dins came too late to save the Delta and to avert the catastrophe that Van had feared. Within a week of the coup, the Viet Cong launched an offensive across the entire northern half of the Delta and in the rubber plantation provinces of the 5th Division above Saigon. There were also assaults of unprecedented scale in the southern half of the Delta, but these attracted less attention because the Vietnamese communists had already solidified so much of their control south of the Basak. The temporary interruption in the line of authority from Saigon caused by the coup facilitated the offensive. The hiatus did not prompt the Viet Cong to strike the blow or explain the offensive's success. Ho and his associates had been building toward this opportunity over the ten months since at back, or more than a year if one took Van's view that Saigon's decline had started in mid-October 1962 when Cao had begun faking operations, and the regime's position had been eroding all the while. The Hanoi leaders had scheduled the opening of the offensive independent of who was in office in Saigon. The National Liberation Front called it the second phase of the APBAC emulation drive. When the new Viet Cong battalions attacked the week after the coup, the structure of the regime in the countryside was like a beam that has been eaten from inside by wood-boring beetles. The instant the beam is stressed, it snaps in two and reveals the powdered residue within. The violence began suddenly, and it was unremitting. Outposts were being assaulted all over the place. Hardly any stretch of road seemed safe from an ambush. One was constantly being shot at by snipers, and to ride in a convoy was hard on the nerves because the norm was no longer whether the convoy might run into a mine, but which truck or jeep would be blown up. Merely to drive to Mytho in the daytime in a civilian car, not a high risk a year before, became dangerous because of the groups of guerrillas who set up shifting roadblocks along the highway. Outposts fell by the dozen that November. In Din Thuong province surrounding Mai Tho, 25 outposts fell that month, many of them large 40 to 50 man garrisons. From a distance across the rice paddies in the morning, one could detect the evidence of the night's harvest by the guerrillas. The Viet Cong would burn the posts after overrunning them, and smoke would still be rising when the light returned to show the ruins and the corpses. It became difficult to sleep at the seminary, because the howitzers crashed all night in response to radio appeals from terrified garrisons, and if the artillery was silent, the planes were bombing to try to save some post. The seminary itself now buttoned up like an outpost at night. The advisors were forbidden to drive the quarter of a mile into town after dark. Toward the end of the month, the Viet Cong grew so bold that they began assaulting outposts close to Mytho in the daytime. One afternoon in late November, while I was in the club at the seminary, questioning several of the advisors, the planes began bombing so close that the ice cubes rattled in the glasses. The guerrillas hardly bothered anymore with the small posts and tiny watchtowers. Their garrisons fled, and those that stayed and survived did so because the Viet Cong left them in place to serve as quartermasters for fresh ammunition. A standard price for a month's survival was 10,000 rounds. The demoralized militiamen would turn it over and requisition 10,000 more to survive next month by telling the district chief that they had been attacked and fired it off themselves. What happened in Din Tuong occurred all over the northern delta and in the ring of provinces above Saigon. Most of the thousands of strategic hamlets that Harkins listed on his charts ceased to exist. By the end of the year, except for Catholic hamlets and other isolated communities that had always opposed the Viet Cong for some particular reason, the regime held little beyond the district centers and the province capitals. The Saigon troops could venture into the general countryside only at a price, a price that the guerrillas raised steadily to discourage intrusions. Areas into which the Saigon side had been able to go before, with a company now required a battalion reinforced by armored personnel carriers with artillery and air cover standing by. On many mornings, the main road out of Mai Tho running west and south into the Delta would itself be cut, and the ARVN would have to send a battalion-sized convoy to open it. The task was laborious. The troops had to search for mines and carefully dig them up and fill in the ditches that guerrillas had ripped across the road during the night with ease. The Viet Cong would simply stuff a culvert under the road with an explosive compound of potassium chlorate and red phosphorus that Hanoi smuggled to them through Cambodia as agricultural fertilizer and touch it off with a detonator. From other towns, other convoys would be pushing out in this morning ceremony that was familiar to those who had fought in the French War.
With their bent for formality, the French had given the ceremony a name. They had called it L'Ouverture de la Route, the opening of the road. Behind the shield the guerrilla fighters erected, the Viet Cong cadres could go unmolested about their work of marshalling the peasantry for the final phase of the revolution in the South. The American leadership had furthered the goal of Ho and his followers to a degree they could not have imagined. The combined distributive powers of Harkins's command and the CIA had exceeded the mid-year figure of a quarter of a million weapons. About 300,000 American arms had been passed out to the Civil Guard, the SDC, the Strategic Hamlet Militia, and the other Irregulars by the beginning of November. Precisely how many of these weapons the Viet Cong captured is impossible to determine. The guerrillas had already seized enough before November to acquire the strength they displayed then, and in November they tipped the cornucopia and weapons began to flow to them by the tens of thousands. The evidence indicates that if one counts the period before November and from then through the first half of 1964, the Vietnamese communists obtained about 200,000 U.S. arms. With the exception of the heavy weapons specialists, the government armed virtually every fighter, right down to the local hamlet guerrillas, on the communist side. The galvanized pipe shotguns and other homemade arms that had been so common became curiosities for collectors. Hanoi seems to have reduced shipments of Soviet-designed semi-automatic carbines and other small arms that it had started to smuggle into the South to be sure the second Viet Minh did not lack for infantry weapons. There was no need for them and they required different ammunition. The Viet Cong commanders wanted to keep their supply procedures as simple as possible by standardizing everything. The American civilian and military leaders of the 1960s tended to see force as a panacea and thought there was no bottom to the reservoir of force they held. They believed that the men in Hanoi could be frightened into abandoning the Viet Cong, and that an end to infiltration and other support from the North would substantially reduce the violence in the South. No one looked closely enough to see that the insurrection drew its main sustenance from the Saigon government in the United States. Colby was opposed to Krulak's scheme. His own program had been, by his subsequent admission, notoriously unsuccessful. All of the teams he had parachuted into the north or smuggled in by boat had either ceased radio communication within a short time or were known to have been captured. One or two were being doubled by their Hanoi captors and were sending messages designed to lure more teams to capture or death. The previous May, McNamara had told Colby to increase the number of teams he was parachuting into the north and to concentrate on sabotage groups. They had perished one after another, just like the earlier teams. Colby had concluded that such World War II-style commando and underground operations were futile and that it would be unconscionable to waste any more lives on them. He said as much to McNamara. The secretary had been undeterred by the losses in May, and he was undeterred now. He listened to me with a cold look and then rejected my advice, Colby recalled. McNamara was influenced by Krulak's belief that the flaw in Colby's program was that it was too small and that a major program run by the military would work. He was also unheeding because Kennedy wanted to try Krulak's scheme. The idea appealed to Kennedy's romantic notions about covert operations. McNamara was performing a role he often fulfilled, that of being the president's of straw man. He was seeing that the president received the moral support of a formal recommendation from his advisors for a decision he wanted to make anyway. Two days after the November Honolulu conference, John Kennedy was assassinated in Dallas by a psychotic sharpshooter named Lee Harvey Oswald. The war in Vietnam that Lyndon Johnson inherited was not much of an American war by comparison with what was to follow. There were 17,000 U.S. servicemen in the South. Less than 120 had been killed, and the number of men wounded seriously enough to require hospitalization had not yet reached 250. Nonetheless, it was an American war. John Kennedy had raised the stars and stripes and shed blood and enveloped in the protection and self-esteem of the United States that half of Vietnam below the 17th parallel, which the Geneva Agreements had said was just a truce zone, but which American statesmen had pronounced a sovereign state and called South Vietnam. Lyndon Johnson was no more willing than others would have been to become the first president to lose a war. The record also indicates that had he been the president-elect in 1960 rather than Kennedy, he probably would not have handled the war up to this point any differently than Kennedy had. Four days after Kennedy's death, 
Johnson formally recorded his intention to Kringe. War in a top-secret national security action memorandum and accepted the recommendation of the November 20th conference to begin large-scale clandestine warfare. McNamara gave the new president a self-serving excuse for the failure to perceive the erosion in the Saigon position and Viet Cong progress before the coup. He flew to South Vietnam again in the latter half of December for a two-day trip. In his report to Johnson on December 21st, he blamed the Nugo Dins and their servants, like Cao. McNamara said it was, my best guess, that the situation has in fact been deteriorating in the countryside since July to a far greater extent than we realized, because of our undue dependence on distorted Vietnamese reporting. His acceptance of July as the start of the decline was an acknowledgement of the analysis the State Department's Bureau of Intelligence and Research had made the previous October to try to warn Kennedy. No effort was made by anyone at the top of the U.S. government to look back further Jan July and see what sort of reports Van and Porter and Ladd and other prescient field advisors had been submitting prior to the coup. The men at the top could not afford to investigate Harkins because McNamara was. He was not relieved and sent home in disgrace like the general whom Patton had replaced after the rout at the Kasserine Pass in 1943. He was not officially blamed at all. McNamara and Taylor gradually undercut him in private. They gave him less and less protection from the public ridicule that built up against him, and they finally insulted him professionally by not inviting him to one of the strategy conferences in Honolulu, asking instead his new deputy, William Westmoreland, whom they sent out in January 1964. They did not remove him. They kept him in command in Vietnam for nearly eight months after the coup until late June 1964. When they did bring him home, he was taken to the East Room of the White House, where the President decorated him with the Distinguished Service Medal in order to say on behalf of a grateful nation, well done to a good and faithful servant. The plan for the major campaign of clandestine warfare, codenamed Operation Plan 34A, was presented to the President at the beginning of January 1964 in a memorandum from Krulak. He referred to the raids as destructive undertakings and said they were designed to result in substantial destruction, economic loss, and harassment. Their tempo and magnitude were intended to rise in three phases through 1964 to targets identified with North Vietnam's economic and industrial well-being. The raids were to be prepared and controlled by Harkins's headquarters rather than the Saigon regime. Joy Msori proved and the strikes began on February 1, 1964, using Vietnamese, Chinese, and Filipino mercenaries. As the attacks unfolded, fast, boats bombarded Henry Cabot Lodge did not think, fast Van did, that the United States should take over the direction of the war. He had grown up with the surrogate system, had seen it succeed elsewhere, and believed that the Saigon government should retain command of its own armed forces and war effort. He stated what he sought in an unintentional description of the surrogate system in a cable prior to the coup. He wanted a regime that was on a par with one of the very unsatisfactory government's radar sites and other coastal installations, commandos were landed by sea to blow up rail and highway bridges near the coast, and teams of saboteurs were parachuted to try to destroy targets farther inland. Groups of Vietnamese trained in psychological warfare were also dropped into the night to attempt to undermine the confidence of the population in Hanoi's rule. Northern fishing boats were seized. The civilian fishermen were kidnapped, taken south to be interrogated for intelligence purposes, and then released off the coast of the north again. Lodge was in a wider sea than he knew how to navigate after the coup. The situation in the south was probably irretrievable for any government in Saigon by November 1st to 1963, but Big Min proved more talented at plotting a coup than governing. He was indecisive. Nothing was done to organize a coherent war effort. He and Don and Kim, they brought in General Din as the fourth member of their junta and gave him the Ministry of the Interior as they had promised, also suffered from the lack of roots among their people and other flaws. I common to the Tory Mandarin class. Khan made an ostentatious start in his paratroopers Red Beret. He had graduated from the French Army Airborne School at Pau in the Pyrenees in 1949 and been a company commander in the 1st Battalion of Parachutists formed for Bao Dai's army. He soon showed himself as indecisive and incapable of governing as his predecessors. All of his energy went into counter-intrigues against the generals and colonels who wanted to replace him as he had replaced Mien's junta.
Every one of these sons of bitches drives by the palace and thinks about how he'd like to shack up in there with his mistresses, Conan said in disgust at the plots and counterplots. The lack of coherence was just as bad on the American side. Lodge and Harkins hardly communicated because there was so much rancor between them from the coup and because Harkins sheltered in new fantasies of victory to come as the Viet Cong built on their gains from the November-December offensive and absorbed more and more of the country. The Central Highlands went the way of the Northern Delta and the rubber plantation country in the spring of 1964. The CIA's organizing work among the Montagnards in the Highlands and the efforts of the Special Forces teams operating there had been wasted because Diem had refused to grant the tribes any of the local autonomy that the minority peoples possessed in the North. He had insisted on assimilating them, precisely what the Montagnards did not want because it meant pertinent victimization in a Vietnamese-dominated society. At the beginning of 1964, the Viet Cong also dispensed with clandestine control and started to assert themselves openly in the coastal rice deltas of central Vietnam, that had been Viet Minh redoubts during the French War. They began there to repeat the pattern of sweeping Saigon's precincts from most of the densely populated countryside, as they had in the Big Delta to the south. Lodge could hoodwink the commanding general and organize the American elements of a coup by himself. He needed the commanding general to organize the American elements of a war effort. After William Westmoreland arrived to be Harkins's deputy, Lodge offered him an office in the embassy so that they could work together. A surprised Westmoreland replied that he was an army officer, and his boss was Harkins. As the intelligence advisors colored their maps with more red each month of 1964, those Americans most responsible retained their positions of influence within the circle of power, or were promoted. Johnson's confidence in McNamara became greater, perhaps, than Kennedy's had been. Krulak was given the third star of a lieutenant general in early 1964 and put in charge of all of the Marines in Holland Smith's Ocean as commanding General Fleet Marine Force Pacific. The Air Force laid bureaucratic claim to his job as watchman of counter-guerrilla warfare to ensure that air power would gain a larger share and brought Anthus home from Vietnam to be the new special assistant for counterinsurgency and special activities. No one reread Wheeler's report on his mission of inquiry after APBAC. In late June, on the advice of McNamara and Taylor, Johnson promoted Wheeler from Chief of Staff of the Army to Chairman of the Joint Chiefs. Taylor gave up the chairmanship to replace Lodge in Saigon. Lodge came home at the beginning of July ostensibly to try to stop Barry Goldwater from gaining the Republican nomination and leading the party to defeat in the fall, and actually because he was a tired and frustrated man who had run out of ideas. He recommended bombing Norty. Johnson had no less confidence in Taylor than he did in McNamara. An agreement between the Pentagon and the State Department that had made Harkins the equal of the ambassador was abrogated. Taylor went to Saigon with the full civil and military authority of a proconsul. Westmoreland succeeded Harkins as commanding general, but he was Taylor's subordinate. Taylor was supposed to use his unhampered authority to organize an effective prosecution of the war. Only Harkins had to retire with honor at the beginning of August. Colby was correct in predicting that Krulak's major campaign of clandestine warfare would be a waste of lives. Operation Plan 34A was as ineffective as Colby's small program. The raids did not intimidate the leaders in Hanoi, nor did they reduce the level of violence in the South. The officers in the Studies and Observations Group in Saigon, the covert section of Harkins's and then Westmoreland's headquarters, who readied the attacks and supervised their execution after Washington had approved each raid in advance, were never able to escalate the program to the destruction of industrial targets as Krulak had envisioned. The task was beyond the capability of their teams of Vietnamese and mercenary Asian saboteurs. Had they succeeded in sabotaging some industries in the North, it would not have made any difference. The sole tangible result of Krulak's scheme was to facilitate the commencement of the larger war in which Krulak was to suffer the rage and despair of Van. The 34A raids, the Tonkin Gulf incident of August 1964, the clashes between torpedo boats of Hanoi's Navy and U.S. Navy destroyers, which Johnson used to crick the Senate into giving him an advance declaration of war for the far higher level of force he had decided. By then he was probably going to have to employ to bend Hanoi to his will. 
McNamara and Dean Rusk helped him by deceiving the Senate Committee on Foreign Relations about the clandestine attacks in secret testimony before the committee. The president thought that his deception was in the best interest of the nation, as did McNamara and Rusk in misleading the senators. Johnson did not want to incur the blame Truman had received for going to war in Korea without a Senate resolution. And at the same time, he wished to avoid a public debate that might bring the Vietnam policy into question. He was sufficiently confident of prevailing to think that he could get by with the form of a declaration, and that his trickery would not be discovered. The statesmen and military leaders of the United States did not understand that their Vietnamese opponents had passed beyond in time to Dacian by 1964, and were willing to risk whatever punishment the greatest power on earth might inflict on them. Walt Rostow, the interventionist intellectual, who was then counselor for policy planning at the State Department, assured Rusk in a memorandum in February that the Hanoi leaders were extremely vulnerable to the blackmail of bombing. Ho Chi Minh has an industrial complex to protect. He is no longer a guerrilla fighter with nothing to lose, Rostow said. At the urging of Lodge, Rusk arranged for the senior Canadian delegate to the ICSC to call at the Prime Minister's office in Hanoi on June 1st. The Canadian diplomat transmitted a secret message designed to reinforce what Washington was trying to communicate through the 34A strikes and preparatory military deployments it was making in Asia at the time and publicizing so that Hanoi would not miss them. He told Pham Van Dong that the patience of the United States was running out and that if the war kept escalating, the greatest devastation would of course result for the DRV itself. DRV means Democratic Republic of Vietnam, i.e. North Vietnam. On August 10th, after Johnson had also used the Tonkin Gulf incident as a pretext to conduct a preliminary round of bombing raids on the North and demonstrate his readiness to punish with the awesome force the United States possessed, the Canadian was sent back with age nor detailed threat. He received the same response he had on the first occasion. Pham Van Dong showed himself utterly unintimidated and calmly resolved to pursue the course upon which the DRV was embarked to what he confidently expected would be its successful conclusion, a Pentagon historian wrote from the report of the Canadian Messenger. By 1964, Ho Chi Minh and Pham Van Dong and the other Vietnamese revolutionaries in Hanoi were prepared to lose the industries they had constructed with hope and sacrifice. They were prepared to risk javing every city and town in the north, bombed into rubble and worse. They were willing to risk anything. Ho and his disciples were not engaged in a limited war. Maxwell Taylor's rationalization to find employment for an unemployed U.S. arm. They were committed to a total war, and there were no limits for them. They could be physically destroyed and the will of their people broken if the United States turned its air power loose on the north without restraint, targeting the flood control system of the Red River Delta and the population itself, killing millions as Curtis LeMay, the chief of staff of the Air Force, wanted to do. Bomb them back into the Stone Age, he said. The men in Hanoi were willing to take that risk, too. The one thing that the United States could not do was to deter them. The communist mandarins had strayed from their destiny in the mid-1950s, when they had been distracted by the fashioning of their Marxist society in the North and in undoing the damage caused by the disastrous fanaticism of their land reform campaign. The southern cadres who survived Diem's terror and disobeyed them in T957 by rebelling against the Ngo Dins and the Americans had recalled them to their destiny. Men like squad leader Dung had kept them in the war. By 1964, it was too late to retreat, whatever the Americans threatened, whatever the Americans did. The men in Hanoi knew that if they did order the Viet Cong cadres to halt, they would lose charge control, because Manerwal defy them and persist in a war that was being won. But they would never issue such an order. To do so would be to deny the central purpose of their lives. Vietnam is one nation, their constitution proclaimed. Their actions were the proof of their refusal to be deterred. They pressed ahead throughout 1964 with the creation of the Second Viet Minh to complete the revolution in the South. The heavy weapons the trawlers had brought in on moonless nights made their first appearance in battle that spring. The Soviet model anti-aircraft machine gun was more accurate against helicopters and fighter bombers than the Browning 50 caliber, because the gun rested on a tall and hefty mount that steadied the weapon and permitted the gunner to swing it more freely. 
The Viet Cong commanders staged a regimental size action in April in the southern half of the Delta, a safe place to perform this first test of simultaneously maneuvering three battalions in combat. The fighting and training and organizing went on all through the summer and fall of 1964, and by the end of the year the Hanoi leaders were close to their goal. On January 2, 1963, the Viet Cong had been a hesitant force of approximately 23,000 regular and regional guerrillas assembled in 25 battalions of varying strengths, from 150 to 300 men, and sundry provincial companies and district platoons. By December, these 23 Thuos and guerrillas had grown twice over and then some into an army of 56,000 confident and well-trained troops. The 25 catch-all battalions and assorted companies and platoons had been transformed into 73 uniformly strong battalions, 66 infantry units, and an additional seven heavy weapons and anti-aircraft machine gun battalions. The infantry battalions were formidable task forces of 600 to 700 men each. The JGS intelligence information had said in the summer of 1963 that the Viet Cong were moving toward 600-man battalions, but Halberstam, feeling so much pressure, had settled in his August 15th dispatch for a more conservative report that spoke of 400-man formations. They had seemed menacing enough at the time. Most of the battalions had been organized into regiments complete with communications, engineer, and other combat support units, and the Viet Cong commanders were in the process of forming the regiments into divisions. This army of 56,000 fighters was backed by another 40,000 men in base echelon training, supply, medical, and related services. Nearly six years of pain and dying had been necessary to raise the desperate remnant of 2,000 Viet Minh in the spring of 1957 to the 23,000 uncertain guerrillas of the day of APBAC. It had taken less than two years with the help of DM and the Americans to form the Sledgehammer Battalions of December 1964. The hammers began to break the ARVN into pieces that month. On December 9th, an unprecedented ambush occurred on a road in the rubber plantation country, 40 miles east of Saigon. An entire company of 14 M113S was destroyed. All of the armored personnel carriers smashed into hulks by a recoilless cannon. An L-19 and two of the Huey gunships that came to their assistance were shot down. Although no one in Saigon knew it, the ambushers were two battalions from one of the new Viet Cong regiments. At the end of the month, the Viet Cong commanders baited the Saigon side into battle in the same area by repeatedly attacking a district center and overrunning the outposts, protecting a neighboring hamlet of northern Catholic refugees called Bin Gia. On December 31, 1964, an elite Saigon Marine Battalion of 326 officers and men was decimated in a giant ambush amid the rubber trees near Bin Gia. Almost two-thirds of the Saigon Marines were killed, wounded, or captured. Twenty-nine of the battalion's 35 officers died. Another elite Saigon battalion was operating close by that day. One of the new Ranger battalions Westmoreland had formed to try to strengthen the ARVN. It suffered a worse fate in a second giant ambush and was literally wiped out. Nearly 400 officers and men became casualties. The two guerrilla regiments responsible for the ambushes were part of a still larger unit, whose existence was also unknown to Westmoreland and the ARVN generals, the 9th Viet Cong Division, the first division of the 2nd Viet Minh to become operational in the South. Only the intervention of the regular armed forces of the United States could now prevent the collapse of the Saigon regime and the unification of Vietnam by the men in Hanoi. The alternative that Van had been convinced was not an alternative. The big American air and ground war in Vietnam had become inevitable. Ziegler remembered what Van would say when the subject came up of bringing the U.S. Army and the Marine Corps out to take over the war. It would be the worst possible move, Van said. They had to find a way to make the ARVN fight because waging the war with a Vietnamese army was the only course that made sense. The Viet Cong were so intermingled with the peasantry that the Saigon troops had difficulty distinguishing friend from foe. Think, Van said how much more difficult it would be for Americans. The American soldiers would soon start to see the whole rural population as the enemy. The Army and the Marine Corps would create a bloody morass into which they and the Vietnamese peasantry would sink. We'd end up shooting at everything. Men, women, kids, and the buffaloes, Van said. 